Aloha and welcome to Native Stories. Native Stories exists to share the voices of those connected to the land. Aloha kako. O wao na nea lo ko ino no papa kuleo wa humeo no ao ma kamuki. I'm Nanea Lo, and I come from Papukuleo, Oahu, um, and I'm now resigning in Kamuki. Today we have a cool guest uh, with us to talk about one of my favorite holidays in the Hawaiian Kingdom, which is La Ku'oko'a, Hawaiian Independence Day. Um, we've been sharing on our Facebook and Instagram about um, La Ku'oko'a for this past couple of weeks, and um, please find our accounts there, just search Native Stories and Our Native Stories um, for all the events happening near you throughout the Hawaiian Kingdom and abroad. And so Native Stories thought we'd get someone that could tell you all about it because we know that we have a big diaspora following and people who might not really know or just hear about La Kuokoa but not really know much about it. Um, so... Our guest is none other than Hawaiian Kingdom Ea Pro or Independence Professional himself, Keanu Sai. So, Keanu, would you be so kind in introducing yourself to our Native Stories Ohana? Sure. Uh, well, my name is Keanu. Uh, I grew up in a valley called Kuli O'o on the east side of Oahu, uh, part of the Reeves Ohana. So, I grew up on nine acres of the old homestead program. And, uh, yes, Keanu Reeves, the movie actor, is my cousin. Uh, his dad and my mom are first cousins. Uh, both of us were, were actually the same age. And, uh, we were named after my grandfather, Henry Keanu Reeves, which is my mom's dad. Uh, um, I graduated from the Kamehameha schools in 1982. And after Kamehameha, I went on to a military college, New Mexico Military Institute. Got my commission as a second lieutenant in the Army Reserves, early commissioning program, and an associate's degree. Then I transferred to the University of Hawaii in 1984 to get my bachelor's degree, finished it in 87, and then I went off and fulfilled my my contract that I signed, three years active duty, three years reserve uh, with, uh, with the Army. Uh, enrolled in the uh, first of the 487 field artillery and I pretty much stayed in that unit to fulfill my obligations, both active and reserve. And uh, in fact, my my unit has been deployed to all the wars since. In fact, they're, uh, they've been deployed to Afghanistan. And I have a son who joined the military, the same unit as I did, and is currently deployed in Afghanistan. He's a uh-huh. police officer with the Honolulu Police Department. So uh, I got out in 1994. Because I needed, because I began to uncover information that would have major consequences, especially for me being in the military. I needed to, to address the issue of what I came to understand as Hawaii's occupation. That was back in 1994. So I was on the mm-hmm. discharge, uh, been on this track, which included representing the Hawaiian Kingdom at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Netherlands from 1999 to 2001, I was the lead agent, sort of the legal team. And this was the old, this is the oldest world court today. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the permanent court of arbitration established in 1899. Uh, after coming back from the Netherlands, we needed to address, uh, denationalization, which is a false narrative that this is the United States and that we're the 50th state because of our arguments and proceedings held at the Permanent Court of Arbitration. That was all based and confirmed and acknowledged by that international body that the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists. And what we needed to do is we needed to address the fact that people didn't know that. In fact, in uh, we had a meeting in the Netherlands after the last day of the hearing, uh, which was held on December 8, 2000, the year 2000. Uh, the very next day, uh, we actually met with an ambassador from Rwanda who called us to a meeting to meet with him in Brussels, Belgium, because he had reviewed all of the information and pleadings and records of the case, which we made it open to uh, other countries to access. Mm-hmm. So that's what he did. And uh, he shared with me and my legal team in our meeting 
that it is clear Hawaii is occupied and that um, the occupation has to come to an end and that Rwanda is prepared and that he's been directed by the president through the Minnesota of Foreign Affairs to him as the ambassador for Rwanda, that they are prepared to report to the United Nations General Assembly, put it on the agenda about Hawaii's occupation, and begin to address that and address over a century of non-compliance to international law. So that prompted myself and my legal team to have a, 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 a meeting, a quick meeting. So I excused myself from the ambassador. We had a quick meeting in that, in that cafe. And uh, I went back and I sat back down after this meeting and I stated to the ambassador, his name was Dr. Bill Zagara. I said, please convey to your president our sincere gratitude. But we cannot accept this offer at this time. Our people back home have no clue mm-hmm. of the profound status of Hawaii as an independent state under a prolonged military occupation. Mm-hmm. We have to go home and address denationalization that was implemented in the pub, in the school system. Yeah. Just at the turn of uh, of the 20th century, around 1906. That has done such a devastating effect on the national consciousness of at this stage my tutu's generation. She was born in 1910. Yeah. Which led to my dad's generation, which led to me. By today people didn't know the Hawaiian kingdom even existed. They they, they would hear about the Hawaiian Kingdom and think it's a sovereignty group or one of the many sovereignty groups and not that it was a country. Yeah. So the ambassador, so the ambassador thanked me and I thanked him and I said, we need to go home and begin re-education. That's when it was decided that because I already had a bachelor's degree at the University of Hawaii, 1987 in sociology, I knew what was being taught and it was wrong. Mm-hmm. I could, I could see both sides now and my job as understood by the legal team, was to engage the misinformation. So I enrolled in the political science department, uh, get my master's degree, which I got in 2004. And then I got my PhD in 2008. And it addressed the continued existence of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And since then, I can tell you that within, within the last 20 years, the, the the conversation has changed, and it's pretty awesome. Yes, <laughs> amen. Two years, so many people <laughs> who are educated now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's like a yeah. for us at Native Stories, like there's there's a such a strong component of a education and re-educating our people and allies and whoever just in general about Hawaii and us being a nation, like. We're not a myth. We're not a unicorn. <laughs> and mm-hmm. we just did a Mauna series um, with all the folks um, up on Pu'u Hulu Hulu. And so that was kind of the kind of reoccurring theme is that not only are we holding space in these different spaces across the kingdom, but like holding space in people's actual minds and having that mm-hmm resurgence and that yeah space for them to know about the history and their people and all of the good work that everyone is doing sorry i'm just plugging you know i I, so i'm a i'm a firm believer in education Mm -hmm. um because education informs decision making yes and and what we are now waking up to is that we have been here in Hawaii. We've been in a crisis mm-hmm. since 1893. Mm-hmm. And when you're in a crisis, as, as I've learned in the, in the military, mm-hmm. we were trained in crisis management, right? So there are those who are in a crisis that react to the crisis. And that is a natural uh, behavior where they run away, you know, for survival. Mm. Right, it's like an active shooter situation. Those who react to the crisis are running to protect themselves. Mm-hmm. Now, those that are responding to the crisis, not reacting but responding, let's say law enforcement, they actually walk into the crisis. Mm-hmm. Right, they go to the gunfire. Okay. Now, the first thing that you do in a crisis management situation 
is not to make decisions, but rather gather information as you enter the crisis. Mm -hmm. And that information is what informs the decision making as to how you address it. So in 1994, when I, when I came to this realization that Hawaii's occupied, mm -hmm. that's when I saw the crisis. <laughs> I was like, okay, am I in the right army? Uh, it, 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 is there, are there ramifications for me now that I've come to this conclusion? Well, I was honorably discharged and I hold no ill will toward my, my time in the military. In fact, mm -hmm. I enjoyed it. Great training, you know. A lot of Hawaiians excel in the military. Mm -hmm. But for me, I had to move forward and get more information. And as mm -hmm. I got more information is when it informed my decision-making process. So what I shared earlier, that, that narrative, uh, that narrative was pretty much founded on crisis management and not reacting to the crisis. Yeah. It kept walking into the storm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what's important. That's what's important. But I do understand how people will react automatically. Like, oh my God, what? We're occupied. And they panic. <laughs> yeah. And then they start running away. Well, those are not decision makers. Those are those running for, for uh, shelter. But, but not to, so to respond to a crisis is not normal. To run from a crisis is normal. Mm -hmm. It's, it's survival. Yeah. But to, Enter the crisis and go in and get information no matter how hard it is and, 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 and the fire that is coming at you. It's, you have to be trained in that. It's, nobody is in their right mind to go into the crisis, yeah. right? Going into the storm. But my training in the military, uh, helped with that. Helped me develop that. Exactly. Yeah. From a professional standpoint. Um, so, that was great. <laughs> but um, moving on. So what is la kuokoa? The big question. So like, you know, like logistics and stuff. Or when is it? What is it? Why do we celebrate it here in the kingdom? Who celebrates it? And like kind of share about the history of it too. Okay. Um, so... La Kuokoa, so La in, in the Hawaiian language is day. Kuokoa is independence. So La Kuokoa is independence day. Yeah. Mm. Like, uh, the United States of America's independence day is July 4th. The Hawaiian Kingdom's independence day is November 28th. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, one thing that we have in common with the United States of America is that, uh, both our countries used to be part of the British Empire. So the 13 former colonies on the east coast of the United States, of what we know now as the United States, were British colonies. Okay. The Hawaiian Kingdom, since 1794, King Kamehameha I joined the British Empire as a protectorate. So he came under King George III at that time. Right? Mm -hmm. Now King George III was also the king at the time of the 13 former colonies rebelling against British authority. Now remember, these guys were British. George Washington and Ben Franklin were British. They weren't American yet. Yeah. And in 1776, July 4th, they declared their independence, but they didn't get it yet. They only got their independence after seven years of fighting called a revolution. In 1783, that's when King George III recognized them as 13 independent states. See, then these 13 former British colonies were separated and became independent of Great Britain and became a country of their own, right? Well, actually three countries of their own. Each of those uh, former colonies, like the state of New York, Pennsylvania, they're actually independent states in a loose union called the Confederation. It wasn't until uh, 1789 is after six years of independence, they became they gave up their independence into a federal government. And that's what came to be known today as the United States of America since 1789. But the United States recognized July 4th when they declared their independence as their independence day. Right. Oh, okay. So now we, so now we take a look at Hawaii. Now Hawaii in 1794, as I stated, was a part of the British Empire. We didn't, we were not forced to join the British Empire. In fact, Kamehameha I and his chiefs 
were very receptive to joining, right? Because they were pairing up with the largest naval power in the world at that time. Yeah. And, and as Ali'i, they knew, okay, let's align ourselves up with, with the big boys, but we come in under our terms. Yeah, and then I it love, has to be mutually agreed upon. I love how, like, our Ali'i were just so intelligent in, and how they align themselves with different world powers and, like, their strategy. I feel like... Right. A lot of people need to hear about that because, like I was saying, like sometimes I feel like when I talk to people, they think that the Hawaiian kingdom is just a myth, but there's so right. much rich, deep histories and connections with, you know, all these outside entities. Like, I've traveled abroad too, and going to different countries, like, they don't, a lot of people don't look at Hawaii as a part of America. Like, some do, but that's mostly if I meet another like other Americans, but if right. it's like international folks, they still view Hawaii as a kingdom. It's it's amazing. Yeah, no, I, I run into that too. You know, you're right. <laughs> you know, so so that idea of aligning yourselves up with the power broker, right? Mm-hmm. That is something that is is in Ali'i culture. Yeah. And so I'll give you a, an example. So Kaiana, Kaiana, a very well known chief mm-hmm. under Kamehameha the first. He actually used to be part of the Maui kingdom, right? Yeah. Uh, he and some chiefs rebelled, right? They lost. So he became a part of the Kauai kingdom under King Kaeo, right? The brother of Kaikili. Mm-hmm. So when Kaiana was, uh, he, he, he boarded the ship called the Nutka with Captain Mears. Kaiana was the first Ali to travel around the Pacific to China to what we know as today as Canada. And he, he gathered a lot of weapons because Ali'i, that was their job that when the king calls them, they got to bring an army. Mm-hmm. So when he arrived back home, he saw that he was not in the best favor of Kael because Kael was looking at him like he's a threat now. <laughs> mm-hmm. So Ka'il, so Kaiana tells Captain Mears, uh, well, he couldn't go back to Maui, the Maui kingdom. He's now leading the Kauai kingdom. He said, take me to Kamehameha. So he went to Kamehameha and he aligned up with Kamehameha and became one of the major chiefs with Kamehameha. So it shows you alignment with, yeah. with, with power. In the Hawaiian language, it's mana, right? Mm-hmm. So what Kamehameha did to King George III was no different than what other chiefs did to Kamehameha, aligned themselves up. And when they became a part of the British Empire, uh, there was a plaque that was given uh, to Kamehameha I stating for all people coming, all countries, that that the kingdom of Hawaii, Hawaii I uh, was British. And that Kamehameha I was still king. See, and that's different from being a colony. Yeah. A colony under British customs, you gotta have you gotta be a governor general. And that governor general is not from there. It's he's he is sent from Britain to represent the king. Just as you have you had governor generals in Australia, New Zealand, mm-hmm. and Canada. Here in Hawaii, we're part of the British, but there was no governor general here. Yeah, so we had a king. Yeah, we had our own form of government. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it was it was distinct, it was unique. But you start to see in our history, Kamehameha the first, after the Battle of Nuuanu in 1795, he begins to implement certain aspects of British governance. For one, he he creates the position of prime minister, and he mm-hmm. appointed Kalani Moku. As prime minister. Now, prime minister, uh, in, in British custom, prime minister is head of government. The king is head of state. So you have a separation there. One runs the government, the other represents the state. Okay. Now, Kaladi Moku, who was the prime minister, he would be approached by foreigners coming in and he would be the one making all the decisions. And these foreigners would refer to Kaladi Moku as Billy Pitt. Now, Billy Pitt, was also the name of his counterpart in Great Britain, the Prime Minister of King George the Third. His name was William Pitt, the Younger. Hmm. Right. So when when foreigners come, they clearly knew Hawaii was British. Yeah. And they knew who they had to deal with, the Prime Minister, Billy Pitt. Mm-hmm. Right. And the flag of the Hawaiian Kingdom at that time was the Union Jack in the corner with the red background. That's like a naval flag. Right. So when mm-hmm. When, when foreigners come around, they see that flag that's British. 
And that's yeah. part of the British, na- the, the part of the Brit- um, Great Britain. And that's the big power at that time. Mm-hmm. So as Hawaii is e- evolving into British forms of governance, right? They're not trying to mimic. They're incorporating it into Hawaiian governance, right? Into the elite system. Mm. Um, by 1839, you start to get uh, conflicts with, uh, in, the, in this case, Captain Laplace, a French naval officer, is threatening to level Honolulu because Commander the uh, Third uh, proclaimed an anti-Catholic statute, right? Because certain Catholic missionaries who weren't British came into Hawaii. And it went against the religion of the Hawaiian kingdom, which was Protestant at that time. Oh. So that created a situation there, right? Because there was no religious tolerance in the country called the Hawaiian kingdom. Yeah. And, and they were making a point. But then he, remember the third, had to learn about religious tolerance, that there's no threat to the country if people merely uh, worship a different way, right? Mm-hmm. Well, that eventually led, though, to the takeover by Captain Laplace. Now, since then, from 1839, the III was already seeking independence from Great Britain. But what we're going to do at that time is not do as the British colonies of, of Eastern America did, East America, uh, East, the Eastern Coast, where they declare their independence and have a revolution. the III is going to commission in 1842 three envoys to secure interna- to secure recognition from Great Britain of Hawaii's independence through diplomacy, not through revolt. That, mm-hmm. That's different, right? So these three people were um, Sir right. George Simpson, who was British. <laughs> Sir George Simpson was British. He actually was the governor general for the Hudson Bay Company uh, at Fort Vancouver. He came to Hawaii. He saw where Hawaii was, and he he volunteered his, his himself to assist Commandment III in securing the recognition of Hawaiian independence from Great Britain. So it's going to be diplomacy. And then he left to go back to London, and he went via Siberia. Imagine that. He <laughs> went from Hawaii, he went uh, west instead of going east. Because you got to keep in mind, there was no Panama Canal at that time. Right? Yeah. And then after he left, Commandment III appointed... Timoteo Ha'alilio, his personal secretary and friend, and William Richards, a, 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 a uh, what do you call it? A, uh, a former missionary who, be, who, who was employed into the Hawaiian government as an advisor, right? Mm-hmm. So what happened was, Ha'alilio and Richards, they had to go first to the United States. So they're going to go to Mexico, cross over that peninsula on donkey, you know, it, it was a rough trek. Go to Louisiana, catch a, uh, catch a, uh, a, a ship to Washington, D.C., and approach Daniel Webster, the Secretary of State of the United States, and speak of this Hawaii being independent and would the United States acknowledge Hawaiian independence. Mm-hmm. Now, we didn't need to get independence from the United States. We needed to get recognition of independence from Great Britain. Yeah. If anything, it's the United States, who was also involved in Hawaii at that time, would need to acknowledge it. But also the French, because of Captain Laplace, acknowledge it. But the main one, where we needed, the main country that where we needed our recognition of independence had to come from Great Britain. Just like the United States needed recognition of its independence from Great Britain, because they were used to be British. Mm-hmm. Right? So, uh, President Tyler uh, notified the Congress that uh, the United States is prepared to acknowledge and recognize Hawaiian independence, but they're holding off until the other major powers have come to a decision. And that would be Great Britain and also France. So then, uh, Hot Lilio and Richards traveled to Great Britain to meet up with Sir George Simpson. And then from there, uh, uh, Richards and Hot Lilio, as they're negotiating, now mind you, there's no grand plan there. This is crisis management. So they're walking and getting information, Mm -hmm. which will determine their next step. Well, gradually, their next step was to go to Belgium because Belgium had a uh, direct link to uh, to Hawaii called Ladd and Company. 
it was a it was a partnership or business partnership uh, that and that was entered into with the Hawaiian Kingdom. So they went to meet with King Leopold of Belgium, Interesting. and they asked if King Leopold can assist them. Yeah, no, it's diplomacy at it, at its best. <laughs> so they meet with King Leopold, and they ask for his thoughts. And King Leopold says that he doesn't have he's not a major power because they just uh, achieved their independence from the Netherlands, you know, like about. 10, uh, uh, 10 years earlier. Mm. So they're not a major power yet. But what King Leopold said was that he could open up the door for the Hawaiian diplomats to meet with uh, France because King Louis Philippe of France was King Leopold's brother-in-law. So from there, they go to France mm. and they meet with Guizot, who is the foreign minister, and then talk about Hawaiian independence and then they move into, uh, move back to Great Britain. But what they find out while away, and they're negotiating. In February of 1843, Lord Paulette of the British Navy actually takes over Hawaii. And Commander the Third at that time temporarily yields his authority mm-hmm. yeah. to the British authorities, but on condition and pending the outcome of his envoys in securing Hawaiian independence. So this is a really amazing story of things happening simultaneously, you know, on the opposite side of the globe. And you don't have a telephone. You don't yeah. have TV. You know, so they're receiving information by reading it in newspapers. In this case, in France. So there was a, a letter that was written to Ha'alilio from Matteo Kikonawa, who is the father of uh, Ruth Kaili Kolani, Commander the Fourth and Commander the Fifth and Victoria Kamamalu. Okay, so Matayo was also a part of the delegation with Liho Liho, Commander the Second, when they met with uh, King George the Fourth in 1824. Right. So he writes a letter from Hawaii to Ha'alilio, and he basically apprises him of what happened, the takeover by the British officer. And that his work is important. And he even said, it is so important, even if you should die for the cause of the country, that is your duty. Mm. So you can sense the seriousness that this was what was going on. But imagine the pressure on Ha'alilio (laughs) receiving this. It's like the whole country is on his shoulders. (laughs) And that letter didn't help. It only made it bigger. (laughs) You know, so eventually what happened? was uh, they were able to get Great Britain and France to jointly sign a document called the Anglo-Franco Proclamation or the English-French Proclamation, that's how you refer to it, in recognizing at the Court of London Hawaii, the Hawaiian Kingdom, as an independent state, and they signed off on it. And that was on November 28, 1843. Uh, 1844, the United States followed up with a formal acknowledgement of recognizing Hawaiian independence in a letter written by Secretary of State John C. Calhoun on behalf of President Tyler. So that is when Hawaii joined the family of nations, November 28, 1843. It's an important day, like any independence day is important for any country. It's their birth into the family of nations. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and that's why Lakuokoa is so important. And 1893 was supposed to have been the 50th anniversary of Hawaiian independence with great celebrations planned. But then we know what happened. Mm-hmm. The United States overthrew our government illegally on January 17th and began its prolonged occupation until today. Have a... So after when there was like the illegal overthrow and everything... Were people still celebrating um, La Kuokoa that you know of? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like Americans, even though they get taken over by, let's say, another country, Mm -hmm. uh, they still have that memory in their mind, no matter or beside the fact that they're not in control. So they would actually celebrate, but I would say not in the open. Mm -hmm. Uh, It would be private. Let me let let me explain a bit about Hawaii being in the family of nations and what happened in 1893, and then 
you can understand why we we learn not to know it <laughs> okay, okay. as we now progress to where we are today. Mm-hmm. So what is it, what is so important about being in the family of nations? And in 1893, there were only 44 members of the family of nations, meaning 44 independent states, three of which were non-European. One was Haiti. The other one was the Ottoman Empire. The third was the Hawaiian Kingdom. All the rest were there were European or born out of European colonialism, like like Mexico used to be Spanish. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the United States used to be British, right? So they're all part of the family of nations, only 44. Today we have 197 uh, independent states. 193 of them are members of the UN. Okay, as an organization, but Hawaii was was there as part of the family thing since 1843 when Hawaii achieved its independence. What's mm-hmm. important though is that international law, which is a law between the members of the family of nations, applies to Hawaii as it would apply to Great Britain, as it would apply to France. And what is important in that is in international law they distinguish between what is the government of the country called the state as opposed to the state itself, the country. Why that's important is that under international law, war or acts of hostility or acts of war are not necessarily illegal unless it's not justified. But if it's legal, international law regulates warfare. Just as it regulates warfare today when I was in the army. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Hague and Geneva Conventions. Those principles of the Hague and Geneva Conventions were recognized as international law in the 19th century and more so in 1893. The point that I'm making is when the United States president acknowledged after doing an investigation into the overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom government on January 17, 1893, President Cleveland concluded that acts of war were committed by the United States against the Hawaiian Kingdom with an invasion on January 16th and the overthrow of the government on January 17th. When you acknowledge an act of war, what that does is it triggers what is called the state of war, which used to be a state of peace, but it would trigger it into a state of war. And in a state of war, under these rules of international law, even though a government was overthrown militarily, that doesn't mean the country was overthrown, the state. Mm. The state in this case, the Hawaiian kingdom, still exists. No different than when the United States overthrew Saddam Hussein's government in 2003 in Iraq. By overthrowing the Iraqi government, they did not overthrow Iraq as a country. Yeah. What you call that was occupation, right? And it was regulated by the law of occupation, where the occupier, in this case, the United States, in both Iraqi and Hawaii, are supposed to administer the laws of the occupied state until they get a treaty whereby the government could transfer its country, its territory, to the United States. What happened in 1893 was an illegal overthrow of our government, not our country. That's important. Mm -hmm. And international law is able to explain that. Now, then you need a treaty to acquire the country. We don't have a treaty. Five years later, in 1898, the United States Congress just passed a law called a Joint Resolution of Annexation, which is an agreement between the House and Senate, to unilaterally unilaterally take away. Well, the United States Congress cannot pass laws that have any effect beyond its borders. So the United States could no more annex Hawaii in 1898 than the United States could annex Iraq. Its Congress annexed Iraq in 2003. It can't Mm -hmm. because it has no effect. You need a treaty. In our situation, we don't have a treaty. So that means our country is still intact. Yeah. Now, that that now takes it to another level. How do you conceal that from people, let's say my great-grandparents, who knew that Hawaii is still a country? It's not part of the United States. That is when the United States embarked on what is called in international law, denationalization. So denationalization is defined as to obliterate the national consciousness and awareness of the occupied state in the minds 
of the occupied population. Well, they couldn't change the minds of the adults, my great-grandparents. The United States took over the schools throughout Hawaii and began to indoctrinate through inculcation, brainwashing, my grandparents' generation, my tutu's generation. My tutu was born in 1910. Everything they learned was American. Speak English. If you speak the Hawaiian language, which is the national language of the country, you get beaten. Right? To what degree varies. By the time I got to my dad's generation, it's already institutionalized. My dad, who went to St. Louis, and he was born in 1939, he didn't know anything. By the time he got to me at the Kamehameha schools, when I was there from 1978, and then I graduated in 1982, out of sight, out of mind. I didn't know anything about the Hawaiian Kingdom. In fact, I went to a military college in New Mexico Military Institute at, you know, in Roswell, New Mexico. I didn't know. Mm-hmm. Now you take that as the backdrop and Hawaii's Independence Day as a holiday. It was gradually erased from the memory of our minds. Mm-hmm. That's spooky. And- but, but it is only because of education and original source documentation that has opened what was always closed. And one of the prominent and profound event of Hawaii is La Kuoko. Because that is what launched us into the international arena. Mm. Where we became an equal to Great Britain. Now some people might say, yeah, but Hawaii was small. Did you know that uh, there's a country in Europe called Luxembourg, right? Luxembourg is about the size of Oahu. (laughs) So we're not the smallest country. And you also have another country called Liechtenstein in Europe. Liechtenstein is about the size of Olokani. So this idea of size doesn't matter. But if you are an independent state, you are equal. You are equal under the law. We may be smaller than Russia, smaller than the United States, but we're equal under the law. And it was international law that we have now realized was protecting the status of our country. That's why we could go to the permanent court of arbitrations because the permanent court of arbitration in the Netherlands for a court case that we had, that we we're a part of mm-hmm. had to first verify whether or not the Hawaiian kingdom still exists as a state. Yeah. And they said, yes, it does. And that is important. So again, the importance of, of, of history as it, informs decision making I, I I have this way of thinking and I got this from the military but also it's a Hawaiian thought as well mm-hmm. right it's a Hawaiian framework so the practical value of history is that it's a film of the past run through the projector of today onto the screen of tomorrow that film never changes but your projector has to get updated to process the film and then you see something in the future that you didn't see before So Mm. history is not to live in the past. History is to understand the past as it informs your decision making as you move into the future. Mm. So we should never be talking about what should we do in the future. We should always be asking what happened. Because once you understand what happened, then you know where you got to (laughs) go. It's a no brainer. Oh, we got to go. We got to turn left. (laughs) Mm -hmm. We have to not turn right because now I know what the fork in the road is and what, it, what we're coming up to. So that's why education is important. So just as they implemented the policy of denationalization in 1906, that formal policy, they weaponized education, which led to our denationalization. We are now weaponizing education again to right the wrong. Mm. So there's, a, there's a, um, a famous quote by this guy, Donald James, a British novelist. And and he wrote, which is so appropriate to Hawaii, but he wasn't talking about Hawaii. <laughs> he wrote, when a well-packaged web of lies has been passed down from generation to generation, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> you might say that we have when we were bringing out this information in the mid-90s, people thought we were part of the sovereignty movement. They didn't realize we're talking historical records and facts. Yeah. I can tell you that people looked at me back then in the mid-1990s as a lunatic. Mm Because I kept saying the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists. Yeah. What are you talking about? Well, I can assure you 
that from the mid 1990s until today, we have definitely moved, definitely moved from lunacy to normalcy. Yes. <laughs> and that's through education. Yeah. Yes, it's amazing, amazing times right now. Like just seeing, yeah, just be a- being able to have more conversations about people who do know about the history. It's just, yeah, profound and great. <laughs> um, so, oh, so let me ask you, when did you like first start celebrating it? Like after you found all this out, um, for yourself or like what? your family, and all that kind of stuff? So, like for myself, like everyone else, I didn't know. Right? Yeah. I didn't know anything about the Hawaiian Kingdom other than what I was taught, right? That, you know, America came to civilize us because we were uncivilized. Mm-hmm. That is a false narrative. In fact, Hawaii had a literacy rate in the 19th century, second to Scotland. Yeah, now, I mean... Hawaii also had flushing water and electricity before the White House. Who's backwards over here? Mm-hmm. Hawaii had a, the Hawaiian Kingdom had a study abroad program for, for young Hawaiian men and women to travel abroad from 1880 to 1892, get educated in the best schools of other, of these countries and come back home. Right. I know. Shout out to countries. Nalani Balutsky and the Hawaiian Youths Abroad program that just got reestablished. Um, Absolutely. At the Native Hawaiian Student Services at UH Manoa. Absolutely. And, and Nalani's doctoral, dis- doctoral research is on this topic. And I'm actually on a doctoral committee. And we're excited about her research because it's really going to bring in a very needed component into knowing what the Hawaiian Kingdom was from an educational standpoint. It's pretty mind-blowing. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's like we... It's like stepping into the, the shoes of your kupuna. And these shoes are like 15, it, it, it's size 15. And your foot is only size 5. <laughs> it's like you're stepping into these huge shoes. Mm-hmm. We need to grow into the shoes. We need to go back to how they were in order to move forward. So we have a lot to do. But as far as the information, I didn't know about any of this before I began to do my research. Now, the one, the person that that got me to do this, to look, I mean, the person that got me on this road, right, toward lunacy <laughs> and the normalcy yeah. <laughs> was actually my tutu. Uh, I'm the oldest Mopuna. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm the oldest grandchild. I'm the favorite of my tutu. Her name is Rose Kikai Kuihalo Simerson Reeves. She married her Reeves. Uh, my, uh, my grandfather, Henry Keanu Reeves, married my tutu. And that's where I'm tied to Kuli Oo. Mm-hmm. Now, my tutu, uh, got cancer when I was uh, in my last year at New Mexico military. So in May, before I graduated, my mom calls me and says, my tutu is not going to pass away until I come home. And she was already in hospice in my uncle's bedroom, which is right next door to us, because we all lived on nine acres, mm-hmm. all cousins. So when I came home, all my tutu wanted me to do was to sit down and talk to her, to sit down and, and, and talk story, or should I say, I'm not talking. My tutu's talking. Yeah. I'm just listening. And my tutu would only allow me to be in the room. My uncles and aunties could not come in. She'd tell me, close the door. And she would share stories of her childhood. And now this is, she was born in 1910. So she's right at the change. You know? mm-hmm. So her stories were amazing. It was like a window into another kind. Mm-hmm. She never shared that when she was living. But it was like she was re-experiencing her childhood. And she was speaking in that, that sense. One, one particular story that stood out for me was she said that my uncle Paneco, who I knew as uncle Paneco, the older, my older uncle, who would visit the house all the time, uh, she would say that when they were young, she was sad for him because he got spankings, he got dirty lickings because he didn't properly bow before the prince. And then my tutu just goes on about the story. So I go, tutu, uh, try stop. <laughs> <laughs> who's who's Prince? <laughs> you know, uh, do we have an uncle named Prince? Yeah. And she goes, no, Prince. She goes, Prince Kuhio. I went, what? Prince Kuhio was in the house. 
Yeah. He comes over all the time. He's good friends with my dad. I was almost floored. I was like, you serious? I didn't know that. (laughs) And then my tutor just goes on like nothing and talks about everything else. So after a couple of months of going over to my tutor's uh, place and before she passed away, just before she passed away, she, she, she told me, Keanu, I want you to promise me that you will know your genealogy. She said, when you know your genealogy, you will know who you are and what you need to do. I said, okay. Okay, Tutu, I will. I didn't take her up. This was 1984. I didn't take her up on that until 1992. Because mm. <laughs> I was kind of caught up in other things, military, mm-hmm. you know, getting my bachelor's up in UH. But in 1992, I went, oh, I forgot. I got to know my genealogy, my Tutu said. You know, that's so Hawaiian. My Tutu said, it's like a kawoha. And, and I felt bad because I didn't follow through. Mm-hmm. So first thing I did, I went to the archives. And I asked them, uh, I hear you folks help people with genealogy. Uh, I'm trying to find my family's genealogy. So they, they pointed me to a book, two books that I could start. And these two books were called Hawaiian Genealogies. And it was um, a, a transcription of newspaper articles. And Melody, uh, Edith McKenzie uh, was the editor. So I, I, I pulled up the brown one and I went to the index and I, and I said, okay, I'm going to look up my tutu's last name, Simerson. That's not a common name, right? Yeah. It says Simerson. Then it had, had a page and I went, what? So I went to the, that, that page number. I think it was page 58. And it, it covered a, a woman named Lua Apana Simerson from Napoopo. And that's where my tutu was born. So, uh, our family is buried at Kahikolu Church in Napoopo. That I, that I knew. Mm-hmm. So I'm going, Wow, this was published in the Kamakainana newspaper in 1896, and it said, Mo'o genealogy of chiefs. I'm like, what? <laughs> and it started off with Liloa in the 1400s, and it went all the way to my tutu's dad, William Kuakini Simerson, the sister Rose, and the brother Isaac. Heavy. And in this genealogy, I could see um. I can see all my family's, my uncle's names and auntie's names, even my mom's name. I'm like, well, not my mom's name, but my auntie's names. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was like, wow. So what I wanted to do was to know who these people were. And that's when I went head first into the archives where I began to realize the true history of Hawaii and that what was overthrown was the government, not the country, because I knew that from my military experience. Because mm-hmm. in 1990, I was at Fort Sill, Oklahoma as a captain going through Hustle's advance course. That's when the first Gulf War broke out. And we knew, getting intel reports, that even though Saddam Hussein overthrew the Kuwaiti government and drove them into exile, Kuwait still existed. Yeah. Even if Saddam Hussein said he annexed it. No, no, he cannot. There's no treaty. And our job was to expel the Iraqis out of, uh, out of Iraq, which came to be known as Desert Storm. I was up there during Desert Shield, right? So I used my military experience in in assessing the information I'm getting in the archives, I'm like, damn, the only thing that was overthrown in 1893 was the government, not the country, mm-hmm. just like Kuwait. <laughs> and it all, and that's when everything came to, 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 uh, click with uh, you. where I understood it now. Now, now I needed to find out again, me personally, what's the connection between my great grandfather, William Kuwaki, the Simons, and Prince Kuwio? So I started to do the research and lo and behold, I find out that my dad, my, my tutu's dad, was one of the 14 pallbearers of Prince Kuhio's casket. Oh. And that floored me. It floored me. And then I find out he was also one of the pallbearers of Queen Lily Okalani's casket. Wow. All of a sudden, it, it was like I had Kuliana. It's like I have to do what I got to do because it's personal now. Yeah. And that that's what got me to where I'm now today. Yeah. That's amazing model for sharing. No, and that's what that's what history does. It informs decision making. You know, mm-hmm. that's like for us in the in the military, before you come up with a battle plan, the first thing you do is get intel. You know. How did this unit how did these people fight before? Learn from the successes. You capitalize on the successes, learn from the mistakes. That informs the future battle plan. Well, in this case, it's knowing this history that informed me 
in my decision making, which led to, hey, I got to retire. I need to leave after 10 years of the, in the military. I was a battery commander, Alpha uh, Charlie Battery. I was a captain. Honorary discharge. Oh, you know, so I'm not an angry person. Yeah. I was <laughs> a person on a mission. <laughs> and the, that's, that's the path that, that was chosen for me. And that's the path that I've accepted. So after finding all this information out, um, and I know other, like, I feel like around all that time you're finding it out, there's other, you, you had friends and, you know, colleagues and people you're talking to and they're like, okay, thinking like, we need to get all this information out to the Lahui and the public so that they are informed and they have that information. They can make decision making, you know, things. Um, so can you talk about how getting that information and then like distributing out to the public, how in the celebration of La Kuokoa, how that's kind of transformed and I guess the key players and people and, you know, that resurgence of information. Well, it, it, it really started when we came back from the Netherlands. Mm hmm. Uh, in the year 2000, after the oral hearings were held in December of 2000. Um, previous to that, it was, it was knowledge within myself and my two cousins who were part of this journey. Kaui Sai Dudua, who runs, uh, used to be Hola Pai, and now she's Awayo Limu, and, uh, newspapers, and also Umi Ali uh, her brother, we were first cousins. Um, when we came home, from the Netherlands, we knew we had to begin to address misinformation being disseminated at the university level. Mm -hmm. And we had to make sure that it was done in a way that is recognizable throughout the world. And that would be through academic research, right? Use the university system in order for me to achieve the master's degree specializing in international relations and related a PhD and then begin to publish articles, law review and peer review, uh, come up with books, begin teaching classes, because it was running, it, our, this information was running counter to what was being taught at the university. Because mm -hmm. in the university system, whether through Hawaiian studies, the history department, they present the false narrative. Okay, so it was decided that we go back to the university to address the misinformation. Because while I was there, and I got my bachelor's degree in 1987, I was taking classes from Hawaiian studies on the Mahele from Lili Kala. Back then, her last name was Dorton. She was a graduate student. She later changed the name to Kameli Hiva, which people know of today. Um, I was taking classes from Haunani Trans. She was in American Studies. Mm -hmm. And, and the information was so, was so anti Hawaiian Kingdom because they presented it as if the Hawaiian Kingdom was a creation of the American missionaries. I knew that was false after I did my research after the fact, right? Yeah. And, 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 and but there, their, their type of research was really a reaction to the false narrative of denationalization. They just got sucked into it. <laughs> they didn't rely on original source information. It, a lot of it was just rhetoric. And, mm -hmm. and, 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 and Hawaiians were getting angry as I was back then taking classes, but I didn't understand why I was angry. It was more like, and it, it was a us against them, you know, the Haole mm -hmm. versus the native, right? Come to find out that's all wrong. It's completely off base. <laughs> I mean, you had Haole who were actually Hawaiian, Hawaiian subjects. And they were loyal. Yeah. You know, so you had Chinese who were Hawaiian. So we're using Hawaiian wrong. Hawaiian is not ethnic. Hawaiian is a short term for Hawaiian subject, which includes others other than Aboriginal or Native, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, I knew that as we're going back to the university. And I was going to be engaging that, that misinformation. And, uh, well, people didn't take it well. Uh, a lot of them were Hawaiian faculty themselves because it undermined what they've been saying and what they've been teaching. In fact, Professor Kanalo Young from the Hawaiian Studies Department, who eventually became a very good friend of mine, and he sat on my doctor committee. He admitted to me that what they've been teaching in Hawaiian Studies is wrong. Now, that says a lot coming from a tenured professor. Mm -hmm. who he told me he was trying to refute my information that was coming out. And he said he couldn't refute it. 
And he was trying to find a way so that Hawaiian Studies Department can make a course correction on the right history. Because if you read typical books coming out of current scholarship, they always make it seem as if the Native Hawaiians were controlled by the Haole. <laughs> yeah. And it's always like a Haole did everything and the Hawaiians couldn't do anything. And then they try to justify that false narrative by saying we're colonized. We didn't understand the Western system. You yeah. know, we were duped. We were duped. That's completely false. You know, when you understand what it is. So in going back to university, we needed to show that this is not a sovereignty position. This is not a, 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 a position of ideology. This is critical research, analytical rigor, and you are going to get collateral damage. And it's not just limited to those that are non-native with regard to our history, but it, it's going to expose a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And when you expose, expose a false narrative, you have collateral damage. And it's not based on race. It's, it's based on lack of research or double checking issues or, or original source information. So that I knew going in, in, in 2001, when I entered the graduate program. And you just have to keep in mind constant research. You don't, you don't yell. You write papers. Mm. You address the false narrative in a professional way, right? You don't yeah. blame. You just explain. And through that process, it got other people to begin to ask the critical questions in applying research questions. And that grew to a body of scholarship and, and academics that went beyond just, just myself and my two cousins. People also began to see it for themselves. They went ahead and uh, uh, wrote their books, uh, master's thesis, doctor's dissertation, uh, Kamana Beamer, uh, Donovan Prezzo, Willie Kawai, uh, uh, Lawrence Guncher, who's German, uh, Emanuela, uh, 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 a PhD from Italy, now showing the connection between Italy and the Hawaiian Kingdom. This is just amazing. Open. It's a, it's truly amazing. It's, it's, uh, and, and, and through this information that we are now becoming to understand and act upon is when people now see the Hawaiian flag that people thought was the state of Hawaii flag. That's the Hawaiian Kingdom flag. Mm -hmm. that was appropriated by the state of Hawaii, the territory, the republic, and the provisional government who were insurgents. But that's the Hawaiian kingdom flag. And you see the flag now being flown with pride because people now know what's behind the flag and not just looking at the flag. And then what's behind that flag is a proud history. Hey, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Mm -hmm. But it's our country. It's our country. And, and that is when people be, will begin to truly celebrate La Kuokoa, Independence Day, because it now has meaning. And it's just not a word. It has meaning. Patriotism. Yeah. Aloha Aina. Aloha Aina. That's patriotism. Yeah. Hui Aloha Aina, the Hawaiian Patriotic League. Aloha Aina does not mean take care of the land. Mm -hmm. That's Malama Aina. <laughs> this is Aloha Aina, patriotism. Yeah, I just, every time I do a new, um, like, interview with somebody, I, I just love how it all, like, it's just amazing being Kanakamoli because all of our stories are just woven together, like, without even really knowing it or, you know, it's just natural. Right. Um, so... Yeah, nowadays, I feel like there's so much events and people want to get plugged in. And so there's been, like, yeah, a lot of people knowing this history, doing all kind of events across the, you know, Pai Aino, Hawaii. Um, have you been involved in, like, really big productions of Laku Okoa? And, like, can you talk about just some stuff that you've been involved in and other people that been involved in with that? Well, to me, uh, La Kuokoa is personally uh, the greatest national holiday in our country. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And and it and it's really a mindset, right? Yeah. It's it's actually personal, right? Now, as other people begin to be made aware of it and it becomes a part of their mindset, then you can actually converse. You can have constructive dialogue on 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 what took place. In fact, I was just at the University of Hawaii and Honolulu Community College yesterday mm-hmm. doing presentations uh, on the significance of Lakuokoa and also the significance of research that brought this out and distinguishing between the state and the government, right? So when, when, when we present and I'm asked to present, I never have never set up a presentation where I put it together. I always give a presentation if invited, right? Mm-hmm. And if somebody wants to hear me, then you go register for class. <laughs> then you can take my class. <laughs> But I don't go out to promote myself, but I do in talks and presentations and conversations promote an understanding of our history, which includes La Kuokoa, mm. right? So we've always celebrated it in mind. Our kids, my son, my two boys, when they were growing up, they're, they're older now. Mm. Um, uh, they understood what that day was because it always ran around Thanksgiving. Yeah, And I would always explain, in the Hawaiian Kingdom, you didn't have pilgrims being helped to survive by yeah. American Indians. <laughs> that is an American holiday. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there was no Mayflower <laughs> in Hawaii. There's no Plymouth Rock over here. Right? <laughs> so the national holiday here is La Kuokoa. So I would make a joke, okay, we can still have turkey, but I guess we got to put in the emo now. <laughs> <laughs> so we can appropriate that turkey for La Cuoco. But for me, um, you know, I think it's time to drop the turkey. So our celebration tomorrow for my family, my mom and dad, my auntie, uh, and my sister, and my brother-in-law, uh, we got prime rib. <laughs> that, <laughs> that is La Cuoco. <laughs> so we, we started a new tradition of, okay, enough with the turkey. <laughs> We're going prime rib. Uh, so it's, 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 it's again a mindset, but it is so gratifying to see so many people waking up to their history, to our history and owning it. Yeah. That's the key. Owning our history. And then you know what you got to do. And everybody celebrates it in their own way. And I went, I'm, I'm just thinking of all the social movements or all the movements that's happening right now. And how do you feel that um, with all the movements that's happening at Mauna Wakea, Kahuku, um, and Waimanalo, like, how do you feel that this year, especially 2019, how that's just going to influence the celebration of the Kuokoa even more? Well, I think it's, we have to be careful how we... Um, see things in this crisis management Mm. mode, right? It, it, it's very tempting to, to make an issue or certain issues a pivotal point Mm. as if something will change. It is important rather to know what has happened. You're gathering information in the crisis mode as responding to the crisis and it is, it is informing people to do certain things. What I see is happening here is not people are saying, because of Mauna Kea, we need to do this. Yeah. It's because of our knowledge of our history, yeah. we need to do this. Mauna Kea is a part of the problem. It is not the sole problem. But what Mauna Kea has done, there is a phenomenon that I've been seeing. It has galvanized so many people to begin to ask the right questions. Mm. That's what's important because when you ask the right questions, you get the right answer. Then you can ask more questions. We've always been, so you might say we've been, um, as a result of denationalization, we've been explaining a football game using baseball rules. Yeah. All we got to do is learn what are football rules, which is what we're learning and people have learned. And now the, now the football game makes perfect sense. And we realize we won the game. 
It's just the United States is not playing fair under the rules. See, now we now we know how to handle the situation. Instead of yelling, now it's really how we act upon that information. And the first thing that I would say is our people need to protect themselves and their family. They need to educate their family, not in pushing a particular view, but just say, you know what, this is what we're just, it, it's, it's a time of rediscovery. Mm-hmm. I like to call it recovering memory. Mm. We didn't lose it. We're just recovering it. Yeah. And, and, and that's a process. And when you see it from that standpoint, where the past is what drives the future, is where things start to get bigger. When people try to say, hey, this is the future, this is where we have to go, then it fizzles out after a while. <laughs> it needs to have a foundation, a, mm. a continuum. And, and, and this goes to the word in the Hawaiian language, future. So the word future in the Hawaiian language is kaba mahope. Va or manava is time. Mahope is backwards, as opposed to mamua or imua, forward. So when you tell a Hawaiian, look to the future, kaba mahope, they turn to the past. Mm-hmm. That's how it works. In that past is the mo'olelo, where you capitalize on successes, learn from mistakes. That's when you get ike. Now you see something you didn't see before. And that's what drives you into the future. So to a Hawaiian, in our cultural context, which is also military, because our elite were military. Yeah. It is it is the intel that drives the battle plan. It's not the battle plan you create and you cherry pick from the intel what you want to confirm your own bias. No, we've learned that doesn't work. You gotta be careful. So it's knowing that past that drives us into the future. I think that's what you're seeing right now. This is not somebody saying, follow me. People are just saying, I see it. I see what you see because we know. And it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. I feel that too. And I do see that. For me, I think tomorrow, um, yeah, I don't celebrate Thanksgiving um, just because of what I know. And I do celebrate La Kuokoa. I will be celebrating with my family. Um we're same like you all, like, probably going to eat steak. <laughs> I'm <Yeah>. not. <laughs> but for people who maybe want to celebrate it, but don't really know how, like, I guess, what would you recommend? Well, I have a book, which is the new history book at Kamehameha Schools and other high schools and uh, entry uh, college entry courses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's called Uomau, Sovereignty Endures. It's the legal and political history of the Hawaiian Kingdom. I would recommend that people to know Hawaii's history, to begin to know, uh, go get my book online. And yes. you can go to puafoundation.org. So P-U-A foundation.org. And was, you'll see the book. It's only $35. $5 shipping and handling, and it's not to me, it's to the publisher. Go get that book and use that as a basis to learn and also to talk to each other about what's there. It lays out that historical narrative, which will include La Kuokoa and Independence Day and Ha'alileo, but also it takes it all the way till today. And uh, that is something, because this book, this history book, Womau, is actually my doctor dissertation. Mm. And it was, um, I, I took the, the, the initiative to, to create this history book where I needed to uh, transform my doctor dissertation, which is very legal and political, because political science, yeah. into something that is um, easily understood. Uh, basically make it for human consumption. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I can assure people they get plenty of pictures. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's a really good history book. And I think that would be a good start because that doctor dissertation that I did, that was the first move at this level, at the academic level to break the ceiling. Now everyone else is coming through through their own research. But, but I, I'm not saying I did it. But I started it when I got back from the Hague Mm -hmm. because it was our responsibility to do it. Once it broke through, you know, 
then everyone is coming through it and it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But it'll be a good start. So yeah, I mean, foundation.org. I can attest to that because I'm in, um, I'm at UH in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, and my thesis is on 19th century Hawaiian Kingdom infrastructure and spatial use because in the urban planning sector, um, they don't address the Hawaiian Kingdom at all. They just go straight into the territory of Hawaii. So basically erasing um, that infrastructure that was previously there. Right. Um, so wrapping it up, what other projects, are there any other projects that you're working on or that you want people to know about so that they can continue um, in informing themselves and like with the AI education and all of that? Sure. Um, I think, well, not I think, I know that would probably help a lot of people in seeing this from a presentation standpoint. Um, I would recommend people go to hawaiinkingdom.org slash blog. And in the search engine, type in Maui County Council. Okay. And what you'll see are three sto- uh, articles that have video done by a professional of me giving three workshops to the land use committee of the Maui County Council. Okay. And when I was first asked to come in by the chair of the land use committee, Councilwoman Tamara Paltin, um, it was to present on the status of Hawaii under international law. So people can watch the full layout with in a presentation, but also hear the question and answers taking place from the council members mm-hmm. as they are engaging this, 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 this information. And that eventually led to a second uh, workshop and then eventually a third workshop. Now, these workshops, I'm not, I'm not giving testimony to the council members. I'm actually teaching a class. Yeah. And that's what I was brought in as a resource. That Those videos have prompted people contacting me who are in law enforcement, military, because they've watched it. And one particular police officer stated to me after watching those videos, he is now Maka'ala. Now he sees it. He didn't see it before. All he heard was, you know, sovereignty groups yelling and screaming. Mm-hmm. He sees the foundation. And then he started to ask specific questions. What's his role now as law enforcement in this situation? And that's exactly what you start to see with the council members asking, now what? I think that would really be good for a visual that lays it out because it, it shows today people in government or control or in power are now faced with information that they have to deal with. Mm. And, and, and that, that is those three, those three workshops, I would say is, is a good tutorial for people to watch. Yeah. Mahalo. Um, if people want to get in contact with you, um, what's a good avenue? Is it through that website? Well, my email is anu, A-N-U at hawaii.edu. Right. Um, I receive a lot of emails, but, mm-hmm. you know, I get inundated and it's hard for me to respond, you know. So if anybody's listening out there and say, oh, you know, Dr. Sai didn't respond, I, I, I don't have a secretary. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a lot of things happening that are going on and, and, and a good source of information, of current information that is going on is, uh, uh, at, at the blog, hawaiinkingdom.org slash blog. You'll see the latest on what's happening, uh, just two weeks ago, a few weeks back, I, I was in London meeting with Amnesty International. Uh, they are seriously considering recategorizing Hawaii from indigenous people, which were not under the, in the United States, to an armed conflict mm-hmm. between the United States and the Hawaiian Kingdom. I gave a presentation to Middlesex University London Law School, the faculty, and uh, about Hawaii's occupation. Um, the National Lawyers Guild, uh, they're, they're now, uh, uh, there's a resolution out with the National Lawyers Guild, uh, uh, an American Bar Association of Attorneys across the United States, is considering a resolution at, at the executive level, the national level, calling upon the United States to begin to comply with the law of occupation. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of things happening that I'm involved with, 
and I try to respond if I can. Mm-hmm. But but please don't take it as being disrespectful if I don't, <laughs> mm-hmm. because there is information on the blog. Uh, uh, there's so many presentations on YouTube that I've done, and, and, and you know you, you know it's really interesting, and, and I can share this in a in a fun way. Okay. <laughs> so my so my so my auntie Marlene's side. Is a very was a very well-known singer to a particular generation, like my dad's generation, and also my generation. I'm 55 years old, right? Mm-hmm. Now, Mighty Marlene, I can tell you, can sing her song "I Love You" like it's the first time she sang it, but she sang it probably 10,000 times. <laughs> <laughs> but it's always like it has to be the first time because you have new people listening, huh? Yeah. Our family, our family has heard I love you like many, many times, whether at weddings, funerals, you know, just constant. Mm-hmm. Well, well, I feel like my auntie, <laughs> like an entertainer. I've been giving these presentations <laughs> so many times. I'm so glad there's YouTube because <laughs> yeah. no, people can just go watch it <laughs> instead of me saying it over. But I do appreciate the presentation and I knew I like I was at Honolulu Community College. The presentation I gave at Honolulu Community College was the same one that I've always been doing, but because the audience was so receptive, like it's the first time they heard it, it was great. Yeah, yeah. But if I see the but if I see the same people in the audience, I say, Hey what? You guys just go watch YouTube again. <laughs> but if I see somebody not from that I did it that I don't recognize, okay, here we go. I am going to sing I Love You like it's the first time like my auntie Marley. <laughs> <laughs> well, mahalo Nui for sharing your mor- morning with us here at Native Stories and in honor of Laku'o Ko'a and sharing that rich history. And tomorrow is Laku'o Ko'a, the Hawaiian Independence Day, so please, everybody, go out and celebrate. Um, if you all want to further connect with us, you can connect with us on Facebook. Just search Native Stories uh, for daily updates on Native Kind Mail. And we're also having an Instagram silent auction um, happening this weekend for Black Friday um, and Cyber Monday and all that. You can follow us uh, there on Instagram. Search Our Native Stories. We'll have plenty of awesome makana, um or gifts from tons of Kanakamoli artists, practitioners, um, and Maoli kind of things. We have some stuff from Solomon Enos, some up and coming like artists, um, artisans. We have some cool P jewelry that we'll have. So shop with us and help support these stories that we make for you all and that we love deeply. Um, we love doing what we do. So please come support and all the funds will be generated back to, um, our nonprofit and download our mobile app. And listen to us on all streaming podcast outlets. Just search Native Stories. And make sure to share with your ohana, ohuapili lovers, to do ohuahanao, um, and whoever you like. Um, Native Stories prides ourselves in being your resource. And the more you share, the more Ike Hawaii is known. And what better way to celebrate La Kuokoa? Um, just sending plenty of aloha to you all out there. Mahalo nui for tuning in and ha- haoli la kuokoa. Peace. Thank you for listening to us on Native Stories. If you have a story you would like us to tell or want to sponsor a future podcasts, location story, or walking tour, please email us at info at nativestories.org.